Hello, and welcome to DWeb Decoded, the show where we talk to the movers and shakers in the decentralized web. I'm Joe Thornton, content strategist at Filecoin Foundation. Today, we're talking to Primavera Di Filippi. Primavera is a French legal scholar, internet activist, and artist known for her work at the intersection of blockchain technology, arts, and the law. Her research explores the legal implications of blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. She was a founding member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Blockchain Technologies and co-founder of the Internet Governance Forum's Blockchain Technology Working Group. Primavera authored the book Blockchain and the Law in 2018 and holds roles at the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris, the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University, and the Robert Schulman Center at the European University Institute. Her art, influenced by her research, involves creating blockchain-based life forms and has been displayed in various international venues, including the HEK Museum of Digital Art, Ars Electronica, Burning Man, and many others. Primavera, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to start off um, with a discussion about um, the uh, plantoid uh, project that you've had going for quite a long time now. It's uh, something that I find very fascinating, autonomous entities or blockchain life forms. Could you give us um, sort of an overview of of that project and um, you know how the way that, that you conceive of um, autonomous entities, blockchain life forms, and um, a little bit about what you've been doing recently with plantoids? Um, sure. So yeah, the Plantoid project is uh, is quite a early project. Um, the first one was born in 2014. Uh, at the time, it was uh, it was the very low low first evolutions uh, of a blockchain based life form because it was basically just like a Bitcoin eating plant uh, that you will just feed Bitcoins and uh, and it will react and uh, and do some dancing. Um, and then and then this the plantoid species has evolved uh, um, as soon as possible. It has moved into Ethereum uh, so that it could actually develop its own smart contract and so forth. And um, and the idea was always to to use artistic practice in order to illustrate what I consider to be uh, one of the most uh, amazing and revolutionary aspect uh, of blockchain technology, which is the possibility of creating those autonomous entities um, that we call DAO today, um, which have the possibility to be crafted in a way as to be autonomous, but also um, self-sustainable in the sense that they can collect the resources necessary uh, for their own sustenance and possibly also with the possibility of uh, reproducing themselves. And this is where the, the whole concept of a blockchain-based life form came about. Um, and so in the Ethereum iteration, the idea of the plantoid was you would feed the plantoid and um, you know the plantoid um, says thank you, thank you in, a, in, in its own ways uh, with light, music, movement, and so forth. And, uh, and the goal of the plantoid was obviously to accumulate uh, as much funds as possible for the purpose of actually reproducing itself. And, um, and so every plantoid has a particular threshold that is required in order to reproduce. And then whenever that threshold is met through the donations, then, uh, then, then the DAO comes about and uh, uh, it opens a call for proposal and then people can submit propositions about the way in which they envision the next uh, plantoid to evolve into. And, uh, and then all the people that have funded the plantoid, they have a voting power on those propositions uh, up to the point in which they will read a selected winner. And, um, and then the plantoid will then transfer the funds and hire uh, the selected winner, the, the artist that has submitted the proposition to create a new plantoid. Um, so this worked relatively well uh, until I realized that there is, you know, the, the, the point of the plantoid is that it's an evolutionary system. And so it needs to evolve based on its environment. Um, and then when, like a few years ago, basically, when there is there has been all this... Um, uh, hype and um, and developments around NFTs, um, I realized actually the plantoid needs to evolve as well and needs to actually uh, become capable of reproducing itself through digital seeds, where the digital seeds are NFTs. Uh, and so the new the new version of plantoid, which I think so far is the most advanced one, I hope it's going to evolve further, 
it's uh, it's not just donation because you know people are happy to donate but only a limited number of people want to donate um whereas now when you feed the plant out you're actually pollinating it uh and in exchange of that you get an nft and this nft is something that you co-create uh with the plant out so every plant out has uh some kind of generative artwork uh mechanism whether it's actually just traditional generative artworks or whether it's like ai based and so as you feed the plantoid you get the chance for a, for a limited period of time to interact with the plantoid and through this interaction because it has little sensors uh it's listening to you it's looking at you like you can touch it um it's taking all this data and it's processing it through ai or other mechanism and it's generating an artwork, which is a co-created artwork, which can be a poem, uh, can be a video, can be music, etc. So and then it's going to mint this artwork as an NFT and send it back to you. And of course, the more you've paid, the more sophisticated the, the, the digital seed will be. And then whenever this digital seed is sold on the secondary market, uh, the royalties go back to the plantoid. So the plantoid now can collect money, but from the primary market, when you feed it in order to collect the NFT, which is the digital seed, but also on the secondary market, whenever that seed is being disseminated through the world, it's actually helping the reproduction of the plantoid. And then at the end, when the, when the funds have been collected, uh, instead of being uh, as previously, which was the people that fed gets to vote, now it's the people that actually hold that digital seed that have the voting power in order to select uh, what will be the evolution of the plantoid through the propositions. And then the same system is just gonna hire the artist to reproduce itself. Um, so it's interesting because it's, um, it's, it's basically leveraging like what are, what are all the opportunities that the uh, blockchain and NFT market is providing for those blockchain-based life forms to um, capitalize as much as possible so that then they can uh, reproduce as much and as fast as possible. And you're on iteration 15 at the at this point, correct? Yeah. What has the iterative process like that been like? In what ways? I guess like how how has how has the plantoid um, like life form itself evolved over time? What sort of like I you were just you were you were saying like you know you've adopted Ethereum and NFTs into the into the whole process, but what are some lessons you've learned along the way? Uh, between you know zero and fifteen, what kind of adaptations has has the plantoid developed? Like, what are what are some some interesting things you've learned through the process? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it goes it goes really back to the question of what is a blockchain based life form, and uh, a blockchain based life form needs to understand its environment, uh, which is essentially a capitalistic environment. Uh, so the lesson learned is that um, the if you want the plantoid to survive and to strive uh, in its environment, it needs to provide economic incentives for people to feed it, right? It's like, you you know, a flower needs not just to be beautiful, but it also needs to provide some, some things back uh, for the bees to come and pollinate them. Um, so in some way, like, it's, it's interesting because it's, uh, you know, like I was, I was very reticent to just like jump into the NFT thing just for the sake of NFTs. Uh, but in the end, it actually turns out that adding the NFT feature to the plant art actually immensely increased the, um, but the poetry of it, because it's actually nice that it has, that is capable of reproducing through seeds, uh, but also the effectiveness of it, because like, so many more people are donating to plantoids since it is actually providing an NFT in exchange, because which is normal. It's like, you know, either you're just doing philanthropy or you're actually investing into that seed and then you're also trying to shield that seed so that you're also giving visibility to plantoids. So it has created a very symbiotic relationship between the people that feed it and the market and, and, and the plantoid, as opposed to just being this kind of more uh, please help me and give me money. Uh, it has acquired a, a newfound economic agency uh, by actually being able to provide assets that can be also uh, a reward and a, a return on investment. And and when did the generative art um, and NFT part enter the 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 the, the plantoid um, 
like um like the process? first contract that uh, actually issued nfts was uh, was early this year so it was deployed i think in april um so it's a very recent development uh, it was planned on 13 was the first and then and then there has been planted 14 and now planted 15 and then i hope many ma- many more will emerge out of this and, and what is the commission process like you were saying that it will um once once it's reached a certain threshold to reproduce um an artist will be selected to create the next iteration what what is that process like so so it's it's the traditional model of like DAOs and DAOs proposals so uh the smart contract creates like a, a call like i open up uh, the possibility for people to submit propositions. And so anyone, in fact, uh, artist, designer, whatever, anyone can submit a proposition and say, well, given the funds that the plantoid has committed, uh, th- here is what I'm proposing, right? And uh, uh, obviously every plantoid has also some like genetic code that needs to be always uh, passed to his descendants. So they have to be made of chains. They need to have like uh, the Creative Commons uh, license. And then different planters will add different uh, requirements. So right now there is this species of NFTs that are all about AI, generative artwork. So every time to reproduce the new planter needs to fulfill also those requirements. So anyone can submit propositions. There is no restriction. Uh, but then, then only the... Only if you hold one of the digital seeds that have been issued by this uh, plantoid, you have the right to vote. And then when you get like a majority of seeds that vote on a particular proposition, once, once there is like a, once there is a selected winner after a particular period of time, then um, automatically uh, the plantoid will transfer the funds to the winner of the proposition. The, the only non-automatic thing is that the artist that has created the plantoid also need to approve the transfer. Uh, just in order to avoid some kind of like, you know, uh, <laughs> civil attack. Uh, but the artist cannot take the money or cannot choose where the money goes. He can just approve or veto once a collective decision has been made by the seeds. And then can, can you describe the physical aspect of the, the, the plantoid a little bit? Because they're actually quite beautiful. They, 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 they're, you know, they're metal and they use light. And I think, um, like you were saying, pre the pre NFT, a lot of the, the, the idea behind it was, it was kind of like, um, you know, pleading with, with people to, to feed it. Um, and I think the aesthetics were, were a big part of that. Can you describe like the physicality of the, the plantoid a little bit? Yeah. So like when you see them, you might not immediately think that it's a blockchain based art piece, um, because they are very physical. It's like, uh, all the plantoids are made of like metal chains, um and then like mostly recoup materials so far at least but it's basically like yeah you take you take chains and then you create a plant uh with different elements and then they they all are electronic so there is like a little brain uh usually a little arduino or raspberry pi that uh, is controlling the plantoid that is monitoring the blockchain so that it can make the plantoid react uh when there is a transaction so whenever you feed the plantoid the, the brain of the physical piece detects it and then activates it. And then when it's activated, that's when uh, you can interact with the sensor. So, um, you know, there is like DJ plantoids, which has little little knobs and buttons. And so you can you can be the DJ, you can you can create generative music during that particular period of time. Uh, Planted 14 is more of a poet. So you can speak with it and then there is like a little back and forth and then it's going to generate a poem and mint that poem uh, as an NFT. And Plankton 15 is like the most advanced. Uh, so it's like this little um, this little metal sculpture, but then you can you can feed it, it's, it starts speaking to you. And then it also generates a poem, but then it uses AI in order to illustrate that poem. And so you have this kind of audiovisual uh, recording that then gets minted as an NFT. So it's really like, you know, it's, it's just like with nature, uh, there is, different species that are competing with each other for uh, attention and in this case for capital uh, and and you need to both have the best physical instantiation so it's really important that the sculpture itself uh, looks nice but also the governance structure is also very important so you need to like but with at the nft level but also like so there has different plantoids that have been experimented with diver- different governance structure uh, uh, one of the plantoids was, was using like the DAO stack 
uh, model, another planted was like a charity. So it was giving 50% of its uh, collection uh, to um, to a non-profit. So it's really like, it's, it is a digital Darwinism and it is a, an evolutionary algorithm and the planted, who knows what the what the environment wants. And so the planted are kind of like experimenting and trying to see which, what facets and what features are going to be the most fit for their environment. And if the environment likes them, they're going to collect more money. Therefore, they're going to be able to reproduce more and eventually colonize the planet. Um, the planters that are not really appreciated by the environment, they just, they just will fade uh, into extinction. Are there any adaptations that you've found to be like overwhelmingly successful or anything like that with the uh, with plantoids? Yeah, I mean, I think I think they are currently evolving in a direction that is quite popular, which is the NFT, I think, was a fundamental addition. And uh, and I think the AI integration is also very good uh, because it creates those seeds that are very interesting as well, which which can be held by themselves to be an artwork. Uh, and therefore, that might actually acquire value on the secondary market too. Yeah. Where can folks um, go to see one of these? Because I know I, I understand that a lot of them are in are in galleries. Yeah. So currently, I mean, they are, they are a little bit everywhere in the world. Uh, uh, over the times, they have been like disseminated in many places. Uh, the latest one, Plantoid Fifteen, is currently exhibited at the HEC, uh, the Museum of Digital Art uh, in Basel. Uh, there is an actual very good exhibition on uh, blockchain and art uh, until uh, November. So uh, for the people interested, they can go and check it out there. And then, yeah, there is uh, they, they travel quite a lot, actually. Um, oftentimes, like in either in galleries or like in, you know, public places or conferences and stuff like that uh, in order to try and you know, explore the world and collect, uh, find new disseminators and pollinators. So what are, what are some things that you've learned through this process about, you know, the viability of autonomous entities or, or um, how, how has this experience sort of um, affected the way that you feel about the development of like future technology? You know, there's always the example of the autonomous taxi or something, you know, you, you, you own, you have, you, you know, your own autonomous car when you're not using it, it can drive around, pick people up and drop them off and sort of generate passive income. And it can even use those funds intelligently to charge itself. There are all different versions of this. How has this experience sort of informed your your take on on those sort of future forms of, of, of tech? Yeah, I mean, this is actually the reason that the plant was created in the first place was because... Um, you know, within my research, Evan, I was talking a lot about those things. And every time it feels a little bit like, especially in 2014, uh, it feels a lot like I'm talking about science fiction and uh, and actually creating the planet as an instance in order to show, well, actually, it is not science fiction. It can be done now, whether it's going to actually colonize the planet. I don't know, but it can be done. It's, it's right here and right now. Uh, let's look at it and let's think about it. Um, one learnings that I think is an important learnings and, and I'm extremely attached to the physicality of plantoids, but it's that when we talk about blockchain based life forms, I think it's difficult whenever there is this interface with the physical world, it is not a fully blockchain based life form because there is this physicality. So it is actually like a hybrid between like uh metal metal based life form or electronics based life forms and, and a blockchain based life form uh which creates it it makes very it's it's really important i think from the aesthetics and from the artistic uh, perspective of it also like the possibility of interacting with a physical entity really changes the, the way in which this this whole art piece is perceived uh what i've learned though is that it is difficult to talk about a pure blockchain-based life form when it is actually not a pure blockchain-based life form uh, because you also have the problem of the oracles. So you have the question of like, what? how do you deal with that little brain? What What happens if the if the little brain gets broken? Then like you have like you have the spirit of the planet on Ethereum, but there is no longer the, 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 interact, the interaction that is possible. So I noticed that 
while I think they are still blockchain-based life forms, they are not pure form of blockchain-based life forms. And in fact, my next uh, uh, my next mission <laughs> um, as a, as the next evolution of a blockchain-based life form will be another form of art piece that is a pure uh, pure blockchain-based life form that that has similar property of like autonomy, self-evolution, reproducibility, but that does not involve the physical world at all. Uh, and also that 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 dig even further into this kind of symbiotic uh, mutual instrumentalization of humans, market-based mechanism and blockchain uh, with the purpose of actually creating those non-ownable entity because it feels wrong that you can own um, a blockchain-based life form. So it's like those non-ownable tokens that have the capacity to be interacted with even though you cannot actually possess them and yet have the possibility of reproducing itself and, and will reward uh, the people that are contributing to their genetic code in order to enable their evolution uh, with some funds in various situations. It's, it's a little bit, it might take one hour to explain the whole model, but um, it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to be born shortly. <laughs> and in terms of... Um... In terms of these digital life forms or these autonomous entities, what are what are some like, what are so from from these learnings and from this experience, what are some viable like in your opinion, what are some viable um, pr- practical uses for this technology, like the self driving car that you know picks people up and drops them off for passive income? Like, what are what are some uh, categories of of autonomous entities that you you could see emerging in the next? 25 years that are that are really going to change um with the way things work yeah i mean i'm not sure like i think the the autonomous tax is a very good example because people can easily relate to it uh i don't know if that's going to be the most revolutionary uh type of uh of element but i think it's it's interesting because it um it opened up a new new windows of possibilities as to like business models uh i think for the art world it's fascinating by the way like um i think it's very um it's very interesting especially now with ai and whatever it's like uh i think the focus that we have had so far on the artist as being like the the core entity the core focus of attention and uh and then we give money to an artist mainly because we hope that the artists will continue to create works that we like. Um, whereas now, because we can give this kind of technological and economical agency to the art piece itself, uh, we can create systems that are very different in which you will fund the art piece instead of funding the artist. And then it is the art piece that is then electing which artist is entitled to produce more of it. Right, so we're kind of like shifting around the whole concept of like copyright, where the artist is the is the ultimate decision maker, into a model in which actually we can we can promote the production of art by focusing on the art piece rather than the than the artist. I think this is a very interesting field to explore. That uh, that I hope plant arts and and those new blockchain based life form will inspire. I think there is also. Um, in fact, through the period, through the through the years, uh, I've had a few people reaching out about like how can the plantoid model be applied to different things. Uh, in fact, at the at the Museum of uh, Digital Art, there was another project that was actually directly inspired from plantoid, which is this self self uh, own house, which rents itself and then use the funds to upgrade itself or to replicate itself, etc. So. There is like a lot of models. I had some people that were discussing like for community gardens, um, you know, so all those things that I think have more of like a collective and communal aspect to it. It's interesting. Like you can fund a community garden for the community garden to reproduce itself. So even when we fun- think about like common goods and public goods, this is an interesting mechanism in which, but it's, it's not, the problem I think today is that we rely too much on like donation and philanthropy for public goods as opposed to actually coming up with a model in which the public good itself can also generate an economic incentive for people to interact with it 
and for people to actually donate, but it's no longer just donation, it's actually an economic transaction, uh, so that the public goods can foster and replicate while also not being dependent only on people that understand the value of the public goods, but also the people that are doing that for purely private uh, and uh, economic interest, and yet they have an incentive to actually donate uh, funds or transfers funds to those public goods. So I think my, my vision is more like the, the, the self-autonomous car, I think is very like private centered. Uh, but I think those kind of models are really interesting for like communal goods and things that the collective benefits from, but also that you don't want to have one profit center that is the ultimate decision maker about where it's going to be the next one, how it's going to be, and actually enabling the community that has invested into it to also have a decision making and be be more participatory in the in the in the in the decision of the evolution. Um, I think this is a good segue into uh, the a portion of the discussion about NFTs, digital ownership, and intellectual property because I feel like um, an NFT technology, while it's mainly been applied to one off, one of a kind works. Um, there is a huge um, opportunity with NFT technology f- to create more open, more collaborative artwork or just, you know, work in general. Um, and, you know, we're seeing this, I, I, and I know that, you know, you've been, you've been doing some work on, on this uh, a bit yourself, but that they sort of facilitate or, or um, make easier collaboration and um, profit sharing and things like that. Could you um, describe uh, a little bit of um, your work with Remix NFT and um, the ways in which we can use NFT technology to bring, you know, creation, uh, something closer to creative commons rules and sort of computationalize and integrate that into, um, into digital artwork? Yeah. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm a strong uh, proponent and uh, I've been involved uh, with the Creative Commons uh, network like for more than 10 years now. So I'm a, I'm a very strong believer in like, you know, sharing information, openness, open culture and so forth. And, um, and it's interesting because uh, the NFT world uh, somehow oftentimes is actually perceived as antagonist to the creative commons values because there is all this focus on creating digital scarcity which is in fact I, I, you know, I totally against what creative commons is trying to do which is trying to remove the artificial scarcity created by copyright um, at the same time i actually strongly believe that uh, the nfts might be one of the most beautiful gifts that the blockchain ecosystem has given to creative commons uh, because all of students, we're not talking about scarcity at the level of the artwork. We're actually talking about scarcity at the level of the copy, which is something that exists in the physical world, but doesn't exist in the digital world. And so if you think about it, in the digital world, the only way in which an artist, up until recently, could monetize its work is through the licensing of copyright. And so obviously you don't want to be fully open because then you really have no way of monetizing your work. Whereas thanks to NFTs, now all of a sudden there is actually a business model also for creative common artists, uh, which are now in the possibility of completely opening up their their copyright, like CC BY or even there is a lot of CC0 artists in the NFT space because you can sell the copy. And so the work can be freely disseminated everywhere. But if you want the original authentified copy of that work, then you're going to buy the NFT. And, and all of a sudden, this is amazing because it's actually, it is actually perfectly in line with the value of Creative Commons. Um, but at the same time, I think we can do even better. And, uh, and so with Remix NFT, the idea was uh, to create a protocol, a particular NFT protocol that actually demonstrates that we can design more advanced versions of NFTs that are um, actually promoting the value, actively promoting the value of Creative Commons, in particular in the Remix sense. And so Remix NFT is a project that uh, 
Uh, I, initia I initiated many years ago uh, following actually a prompt from Creative Commons to, to show them that NFT can be friendly. Uh, and the idea is that uh, basically if I release a work under Remix NFT, um, there is this mechanism in which no one can fully own this Remix NFT because it's on a perpetual auction. So anyone can overbid in order to obtain that copy. Uh, but the Remix NFT is actually a right. It's actually in, embedded with a, a, a license, which enable me to create a remix of the work that I've just purchased. And so all of a sudden, there is, because of the perpetual auction, there is an incentive to buy the remix as early as possible when, while it's still very cheap to buy and then create remix. And I can create like derivative works because I have the right to do so. And then of course, people can buy my remix or the original remix, but obviously there is a point in which the original remix might, because of the perpetual auction, might become very expensive. And so people will be like, okay, well, maybe I don't want to spend the money to remix the original, but I'm going to remix the remix of the original, right? And so in some way, like this, this particular protocol creates a system of like memification um, in which, because I have put my work under this, uh, this Remix NFT protocol, it is an invitation to the world to remix as much as possible my work. And then, of course, within that protocol, there is a system of um, automatic uh, rewards and redistribution. So on the one hand, because they are all linked to one another, it provides attribution which is something that is very difficult for creative common artists, especially in the digital world. Whereas here, because every NFT is the remix of another NFT, I can trace through the blockchain the genealogical evolution of those works. But also there is an automatic royalty system. So if someone then buys the NFT of any of those remixes, then the funds that are collected are, are, are brought in into the smart contract and then the people from whom that, that remix has been created, they also have a share that they can claim from this. Uh, and so this means that all of a sudden, as an artist, I have an economic incentive to actually promote the creation of derivative works because the more people are creating derivative works, the more money I make because they are purchasing the remix. But also, the more popular those remixes are, and I actually, I want them to be popular. I want them to sell very expensively because then I'm going to get a share. And so in some way, this solve, um, this solve like the three main problem of Creative Commons, which is one, the lack of the copy. And all of a sudden, the NFT as such provide the copy. Uh, it resolved the attribution problem because now we can really easily follow and trace uh, how remixes are made. And then it resolved the business model and, um, and the incentivization so that uh, instead of monetizing my work by closing the copyright, by doing non-derivative or non-commercial, here, on the contrary, I want them to be derivative and commercialized because I will. this will also maximize my own return. Yeah, it's like a, it's a really uh, satisfying kind of inversion of, of a lot of like ways that, that, you know, intellectual property and copyright has had to work for so long. Um, can can you describe some some use cases with within this? Like, what are some examples of, of of works that that could be created and then iterated upon using this system? Yeah, so right now we're actually experimenting with uh, a first application, uh, which is essentially for um, uh, generative AI, uh, because there is like lots of people spending hours and hours uh, just clicking, you know, variation, variation, prompting and whatever. Um, and they're actually doing work. Um, and sometimes you find a particular coordinate in the latent space that is amazing. And then because someone has discovered this coordinate, then many other people can now orbit it around those coordinates to discover other things in the same area of the latent space. And then maybe someone finds an amazing place and then this becomes like a popular NFT that is sold. And, and in some way, it's interesting because generative AI, copyright literally doesn't matter. I mean, at least until now, there is no copyright on the generative AI. And yet those people are doing a lot of work and, and yet you can monetize it because now you can NFT it. And even though I don't, 
I cannot claim copyright over it. I'm still the creator and I have I am the NFT uh, minter, so I can still monetize. But but my 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 mint, my NFT is is only existing because I could rely on someone else that has traveled and that has spent hours orbitating within the latent space. And so because mine was a derivative of the other one, then when I sell my NFT for like $5 million, that person will get a big share of that because that person is actually the one that enabled me to find that coordinates in the latent space. And so the, the generative AI, I think, is a fascinating case study for this because first, it's easy to understand how the dependencies are because it's literally like I'm taking your coordinates and I'm expanding on it. Secondly, because it's also, it is so, um, it is so contentious about whether or not there is copyright. And in some way, it doesn't matter. It could be CC0, it will still work, right? So because I can create a technological infrastructure where I created a, a derivative from your work and that's connected through the blockchain, it doesn't matter if I can claim a copyright on it or not. In fact, the fact that I am, I am the artist that minted it I, I am the one that will monetize the NFT, but I don't want to monetize it just for myself because I want to reward all the people that have supported by exploring this infinite space of the latent space. And so this kind of reward mechanism makes, makes it so that we're all collaborating towards finding those most amazing coordinates and everyone is rewarded according to the actual contribution that they have done. And in this instance of finding um, sort of the this this sweet spot within a generative model is is that so i guess what in 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 what you're describing is this you know artists going through and generating um ai artwork and then you know licensing their seed phrase that brought them to this aesthetic or is this something like um is there like a serial number associated how do you um when generating the this work identify this 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 part of the model that 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 works really well that people will want to license out and reuse yeah i mean basically it's a it's a it's a coordinate of vectors right okay. so there's the prompt there is the seed there's the, 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 the salt and then there is the coordinates so i can i can choose to share the coordinates to whoever purchased the remix nft and then based on this remix NFT, they can then travel in, in the surrounding area of those uh, of these uh, multidimensional uh, vector coordinates. So generative AI is actually the most obvious and simple and yet uh, very, very valuable application of this uh, protocol. And, and it makes me think back to the um, autonomous entities conversation. Um, one thing that I see as a, as a possibility would be like AI artists, basically people who are or not people, but uh, digital entities who are going through other people's works and remixing them uh, and like learning from whether or not people enjoy their work and sort of uh, honing in on uh, something better. Uh, do you see something like that in the future? These, these digital entities... Um, you know, being creative and remixing people's work and participating in this whole ecosystem? Yeah, so um, a good friend of mine, Jean Kogan, is actually uh, working on a similar thing, which is called Abraham, which ideally is this type of autonomous artist that is generating AI and that gets feedback from the community in order to understand what is pleasing, what is less pleasing. Um, I think the only issue today when we talk about actual blockchain-based life form is that um, to my knowledge, the, the, the blockchain today uh, is not really um, viable for uh, doing on-chain um, generative AI. So there is a few projects that are actually emerging for like blockchain-based uh, or decentralized inferential AI and so forth. But I think we're still at the uh, experimental phases on that. So right now, while I think those projects definitely will come about, um, it's not a pure blockchain-based life form, meaning that the processing of the uh, AI model definitely today uh, is still done off-chain. So you can have uh, a blockchain-based life form that then probably will need to like somehow transfer funds to someone to do the processing and then mint it and send it back and then get the curation through the on-chain. So it is possible. Uh, it will. It, there will always be some kind of like Oracle somewhere off-chain that is, that is doing the work. 
Um, maybe in the coming years, we might be able to see some native blockchains that are capable of also doing generative AI. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very looking forward to all this, yes. And one process part that I'm kind of curious about is how do you link the assets to the licensing? So, you know, you, and especially if something is remixable, you're going to need, for example, in a song, if you're going to remix a song, you're going to need all of the stems or the individual tracks, so guitar track, drum track, vocals track. How do you link the um, actual digital assets that make up the work to the license? And how do you sort of pr- do the process of, of, you know, blowing the uh, the the work apart, remixing it, and and you know maintaining that it is uh, the derivative work of of someone else. Yeah. So um, indeed, as a as a consequence of uh, building and developing the remix NFT protocol, uh, we very soon came into a realization that. Uh, we need licensing to be associated with every single one of those tokens. Um, And this licensing cannot be done in the way in which it is currently done on the majority of NFT platforms, which is the term of use are actually dictating uh, what are the rights that are associated with the NFT because uh, ideally there is no platform, first of all, and also we don't want the platform to be able to change the term of use and therefore the copyright associated with the NFTs. And so we developed together with like a, a small a small cohort of blockchain lawyers, um, blockchain and IP lawyers, we, we developed this uh, new type of uh, copyright licensing scheme, uh, which we have called the token bound NFT license. And uh, and the idea here is to create, and it's, it's quite innovative in some way, um, because the problem, the problem in general is like, usually you get a license from the copyright owner and uh, uh, this license is actually either non-transferable uh, or it requires some degree of sub-licensing, meaning that if I transfer my work, then all of a sudden I need to transfer the license or I need to sub-license it, which creates a lot of complexities, um, legal complexity, because especially if there is like so many remix of all directions and, and so forth. And so what we wanted to do was creating a legal system that... Uh, ensure that the license automatically follows the tokens without having to rely on sub-licensing. Um, and so we found this very elegant solution, which is, uh, which is the one that is incorporated into the token bound license, which is relying on a dual licensing model, both of which are public licenses. So in the same way with like Creative Commons is a public license, is a public general license, just like the GPL, which means it's a license that is given to the world at large. There is no there is no personal there is no personal license associated. It's not like I give you a license. The, the whole world can benefit under some conditions that are stipulated in the license. And so what we've done is that we created this kind of general public license, which is the terms and condition under which the work is released by default. If you don't own the token, and you can choose to be as restrictive or open as you want. And then another public license, which is conditional. So it's a conditional public, conditional general public license, where the condition is that you are the current holder of the NFT. And this is very interesting because it means that I don't need to think about personal licenses. I don't need to think about sub licenses because actually it is to the world at large, except that the only way in which you can claim benefits of this license is that you can demonstrate that you currently hold the NFT. And if you don't hold the NFT, even though the license is open to the world at large, then you cannot claim those benefits. And so that's that's pretty good because that means that the moment in which I'm transferring the token, even though the license is exactly the same, the condition is no longer met for me and now it's met for you. And so now you can benefit from those licensing terms, right? And so this is, I think this is like a very elegant uh, solution to a much broad problem in the NFT world. Uh, first, that we are not embedding the licenses into the token, which I think should be done as, as a very standard practice. And secondly, to ensure that these licenses actually follow the token every time it is being transferred without creating all the legal complexity of sub-licensing. And I think this is kind of a good overview of sort of the concept of code is law and maybe a little bit of like blockchain constitutionalism. Would Would you be able to tell me a little bit about 
um, your core research on the concept of blockchain constitutionalism and, and sort of an overview of the just the concept of code as law? Yeah, so I, I don't want to uh, uh, claim ownership on the concept of code is law, which was actually created by Lawrence Lessig. Um, but it is like it is a large uh, portion of my research, which is looking at the way in which uh, code is taking specific functions that usually were assigned uh, to the law. And um, and the way the way the way I'm thinking about it and the way I'm investing it investigating it in my research is basically the concept of uh, regulatory equivalence, uh, which means that today the law stipulates various manners in which uh, a particular actor can comply with specific regulations, uh, and those are like the traditional legal formalities and so forth. And then, and then now we have new technologies, which are quite different. So they are not like, we cannot rely on the traditional concept of functional equivalence because the function is not the same. Yet the concept of regulatory equivalence, which is a little bit more subtle, is that because of the technological guarantees and the technological properties that those new, those new technology provide in the case of blockchain, then we can now actually achieve the same policy objectives through different technologies. And so if I want to be regulatory compliant, I now can choose, would I follow the traditional legal formalities as specified within the law, where the law was actually designed at the time in which the technology didn't exist. And so that's, that was the only way in which we could conceive of regulatory compliance. But now that this, this new technology came with those new technological guarantees, if regulatory equivalence is recognized between those two, it means that now I have a choice. Um, do I want to comply through the traditional formalities in order to be regulatory compliant, or do I want to adopt those alternative technological means which actually achieve the same policy objective and therefore are an alternative path towards regulatory compliance, right? And so this is kind of like the, the facets that I'm looking at. Uh, so it's like a... It's a particular uh, direction of how code is law, which is not just saying that code is replacing uh, or supplanting the law, but that code can actually be used as a regulatory technology to achieve regulatory compliance in ways that actually, in some cases, are more transparent, more accountable, and more efficient than the traditional paper-based formalities. So what contexts do you see um blockchain constitutionalism or co code is law concepts being um, best applied? Like what, what, what parts of uh, society or, or, or law or, um, you know, regulatory frameworks do you see um, blockchain constitutionalism having a, a major effect? Yeah. So blockchain constitutionalism is, a, is a yet another facet of this, which is uh, blockchain constitutionalism is essentially looking at how, um, we are creating systems where there is not one party uh, that can kind of instrumentalize the code, right? So uh, in traditional legal system, we have the concept of the rule of law, uh, which basically means that no one stands above the law. The law applies equally to everyone, including the sovereign, is actually subject to the same uh, legal framework, as opposed to the rule by law, uh, which is when the sovereign is actually instrumentalizing the legal system in order to further its own political uh, interest. And so, and this is like just like traditional uh, legal theory. Now, when we move this into the digital space, we can actually observe that there is some kind of analogy in the sense that if we look at the majority of online platforms today, they are ruled by code meaning that there is a sovereign, which is the operator, which is instrumentalizing the code uh, in order to further its own economic or potentially political interest. Uh, so somehow the code doesn't apply equally to everyone because the operator can constantly uh, modify, change, shut down the code. Uh, when we move into blockchain systems, we move into a system that by analogy to the rule of law uh, looks more like the rule of code, where the rule of code stipulates that 
no one stands above the code. So even though I am the developer, even though I am the one that has deployed a particular blockchain system, uh, I don't actually have the power to shut it down. I don't have the power to influence its operation, to manipulate it. I am equal to everyone else based on what the code prescribed. And so all of Sudan, we, are, we enter into this model that is more of a constitutional model in which there are some technological guarantees that the code once deployed will operate as planned. Of course, there is always bugs and flaws uh, in some cases, but, but there is no one single unilateral actor that actually is the sovereign over the systems. And this is actually what provides those technological guarantees, which therefore can enable new mechanism of regulatory compliance, because I will never trust uh, a technological guarantee that is provided by uh, a system where there is one single operator that can manipulate the data. Um, you know, if you want to do like auditing and reporting, uh, I'm not going to trust you You giving me a database of information that I know you could manipulate. However, if you've been using a blockchain to record information, and if I trust the security and the reliability of this blockchain, I know you couldn't modify it. And so therefore the information you provide me is actually much more reliable. And so I can actually use that as as a proof that you acted in the way that you claim, which will never work if it's an internal database of a company, which obviously has economic incentive to, to manipulate this information before sending it to me. So the, the rule of code is kind of a precondition for this concept of regulatory equivalence and using blockchain technology as a new way of doing uh, regulatory compliance to exist. Yeah, so sort of structuring things out in the open that are like you know the 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 way that it's actually constructed is 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 more openly compliant, uh, and like it's visibly like following the rules in a way, and also like stru- like the way that it's structured, it's actually enacting those those regulations. That's really mm-hmm. interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so in in 2018, you 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 published blockchain and the law, and I'm actually curious. Um, well, could could you give uh, I guess an, an an overview of 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 that that work, and then also, I guess, what were some things that 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 you were you know right about, and then some things that have surprised you and and changed, and how has your view of the the overall topic of of, of that book evolved? Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, it was it took a long time to publish this book because we actually started to write it in two thousand fifteen with uh, Aaron Wright. And um, and like literally, we had to keep revising, revising, revising every six months, uh, not because the law was evolving, but because the technology was evolving. And then in 2018, we were like, okay, that's it. We have to publish now. Otherwise, we're never going to publish. Um, what's interesting is that I think 2018 is perhaps when the technology became more like uh, established. Um, what's interesting is that the the book, in fact, is still quite uh, relevant. It's like, it's not obsolete yet um, because the law actually has not evolved as fast as it could have. Um, there is a lot of things that were already visible visible or at least foreseeable back in 2018, which actually have just further consolidated themselves uh, on, the legal, uh, on the legal front. Um, so actually... The surprising thing is that the book is still relevant, um, meaning that we might need to like do some uh, like the law. The law. The law is coping up, uh, but it's not coping up in any way that was not expected. Uh, the book. The 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 main theory of the book was like we, we brought about this concept of like the rule of code, Lex Cryptographica, where we were we were explaining the fact that there is those new possibilities that are emerging to create systems that have their own internal uh, regulatory framework. But then, of course, it's not because you can have your own internal endogenous system of regulation that the exogenous system of regulation will not try to intervene. Uh, And I think what we're seeing is that... uh, Unfortunately, I guess, but uh, our prediction of how 
the, the legal system might try to intervene in order to regulate a system that is actually designed not to be regulatable actually have come through. <laughs> um, perhaps like, yeah, the, the, I mean, the SEC, we, like, there is no, there is no surprise uh, about this. Uh, I think perhaps the surprising thing that we didn't envision was like the sanctions for like in the case, for instance, of Tornado Cash, but also not surprising. Uh, so yeah, in, in some ways, like the surprise is that there are not as many surprises as uh, I would have hoped for. <laughs> um, so, so the book is still um, surprisingly on on the point. And, uh, um, and yeah, like I think a lot of the, a lot of the um, the prediction, which weren't prediction, it was more like here are all the possible ways in which it might go. Um, many of them actually have come true. <laughs> uh, some of them were already visible early on, but uh, now they have become more more visible than before. Um, so yeah, I think the, the law is evolving, of course. You know, like in, in Europe, we have like the the meek and so forth. So things are evolving, but they are evolving in a in somehow in a predictable direction, which is which is the same direction that has been taken with the internet. And you know, like like every time there are those technology that are decentralized and trying to escape, uh, obviously the, the existing legal system will not just like sit down and watch. They will try to find where are those. Uh, and where are the low-hanging fruits, where are the weak points, and try to regulate those weak points in the same way as on the internet, uh, we regulate the large intermediaries uh, because we cannot regulate the centralized networks, but uh, there is always, even in a polycentric decentralized networks, there are always operators and there are always some degrees of actors that are actually in a particular jurisdiction and they can be regulated. Gotcha. So before we close, um, is there is there anything that you have um, coming up soon that you'd like to uh, plug or uh, you know where where can people find you if they wanted to reach out like um, yeah what do you have what do, what have, what have you got going on or anything that you'd like to plug before the the conclusion here um, yeah so I mean so I have my uh, research project my European research project which is called blockchain gov uh, which you can access at blockchaingov.eu. Uh, where there is like, this is like where all my very academic uh, uh, type of research is um, is uh, is being published. Uh, for plantoids, you can follow up on plantoid.org. Um, and I try to keep the website as update as possible. Um, and then everything that is on uh, Remix and... Uh, um, Remix token bond license. You can check out the the preliminary. It's still very preliminary, but uh, I hope it's gonna evolve very fast. Uh, it's alias studio, and uh, this is where we are. Uh, we have like this kind of uh, MVP for uh, using Remix NFT in the context of generative AI. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for coming on. It was a pleasure talking, um, and hopefully, we'll we can have you back sometime soon. Um, so. Thanks a lot, and uh, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks to you.